I worried about what other people thought because, again, chronic people pleaser. I don't want people to feel uncomfortable. Hello, my name's Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. So, very exciting. This week, we are headed to Stonewall. Only not that stone wall. Sorry if I got your hopes up. Mm. No, we are not headed to the bright lights of New York City, but instead we are headed to small town Oklahoma to visit the Stonewall Tavern, which used to reside in a town called Stillwater. And whilst this bar wasn't technically a gay bar, it did create a safe environment and give people space to be themselves and figure out who they are, which is exactly what you want from a bar, right? And one of the people who found themselves there and who found the space to be themselves there is Anthony Criswell, who is one of the hosts of the Beards and Sundries podcast, alongside his husband, Joe, and their friend, Jay, who you might remember was a guest on a recent episode of this very show right here. And one of the things that I really love the most about this conversation is that Anthony, as a recovering people pleaser, gives some real advice about how to overcome those tendencies to want to put other people's needs in front of your own and instead think about how you could assert yourself and your needs in the moment, which I of course, immediately start to overthink and unpick and kind of take us on a weird little detour. But uh, that's kind of why you keep coming back to the show, right? You like when I just ruin a conversation. (sighs) Why don't we get into it? If I were to be, say, an ignorant foreigner, which obviously I'm not, but if I were to be, and the only thing I knew about Oklahoma is that there is a musical about it, or about something, but it's called Oklahoma anyway. Yes. What would be the three key things that you'd want me to know about Oklahoma, if that was all I knew? Um, We are a poorly educated state. Yay. Um, I'd love to really give you some great selling points on Oklahoma because Tulsa and Oklahoma city are great places to live aside from the weather, but it's a very poorly educated state. I think we rank 47th out of our 50 States uh, for public education. And that stems from a general lack of funding from our, what in America is our Republican party uh, generally runs the government in Oklahoma. Uh, It's a very red state as we call it, which is all very right leaning, Mm -hmm. Our state has purposely gone out of its way to not educate its citizens. And in that miseducation also has sort of tailored what they know so that they typically try to vote Republican. They, They generally vote out of their best interests, and it's baffling to me, um, having grown up here and being able to get my head outside Okay, okay, of wait, let's, let's restart this question. <laughs> let's restart this question. What are three good things okay. about Oklahoma? Because there must be good things since you live there. Okay, yes, I will give you good things, and I apologize for going on at length about something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, the city of Tulsa is a wonderful place to live. I've really enjoyed the environment. It's all of the sort of pros of living living in a big city with none of the cons. Everything's within about 10 to 20 minutes of you. You can get from one side of the city to the other in 20 minutes at most. And if you want to get away for a weekend to get out into the country or go to a lake, we have quite a lot of shoreline uh, as far as lakes are concerned. Um, How many things have I given you? Two things. Lake accessibility. Tulsa's Mm, progressive. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Third good thing about Oklahoma. Hmm. 
<laughs> Don't break no. your neck. <laughs> I know. I'm thinking about it. No, we actually. Uh, I'm a. I'm a hiker. Uh, I like to get out and hike. Um, and actually, am planning once it cools off from the summer and getting more into fall on um, doing some overnight backpacking trips. And there are so many places to do that. At, and there's all of these state parks that exist that are either free or very cheap to go to. Um, and you can get out and go hike and go see the countryside. And it's just lovely. Okay, good. All right. So that's giving me a flavor. So basically nature. Yes, absolutely. I, <laughs> I love getting out in nature. It's my happy place. Uh, it gets me away from people, um, which is awesome. Mm. Yeah. People. So then let's stay on Oklahoma. What was it like growing up as a little queerdo in Oklahoma? Difficult, in a word. <laughs> so I grew up in a town called Glencoe, Oklahoma. Uh, it is a town with a population of about 500 to 600 people at any given time. There are no stoplights in five churches, to give you kind of an idea of Ooh. what that's like. Yeah. Uh, so everybody goes to church. It's not just something that you do for funsies. It's very much a you go Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. And for any additional church activities you are supposed to attend, you go to those. So imagine growing up your entire life, as a lot of people can, with people telling you that being gay is not just wrong and weird, but it's also evil. Um, I'm doing that at least three times a week. Oh, uh, yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so, yeah, you become very adept at sort of hiding who you are, which most queer people do growing up. And uh, it's such mm -hmm. a shame because it puts us all on this weird time delay for experiencing life as we should. Yeah. And so for you, when was the moment when you were like, oh, that thing that they keep talking about in church, I think that might be me. Uh, I was prob honestly, I think I, I knew I was gay from about the age of six, although I, I guess I didn't really know what to call it or really how to define that because, you know, you're six years old and you, you don't know really what's mm -hmm. going on there. You just know what you think and feel. And it wasn't really until I became a teenager that I really realized like, okay, well, this is what's going on. Like I'm, I am attracted to men more than I am women. And... I don't know how to sort of rectify that with my belief systems. I, I can't really reconcile this feeling that won't seem to go away with what I'm being told it, several times a week. Um, so, so you used the word rectify then. Does that mean you were trying to fix it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did for a while. Lots of praying to a God that I no longer believe in. Um, <laughs> and so... It was very, oh. looking back on it and going through a lot of therapy about it, it was very traumatic. Um, it was hard to have this innate quality that I could not get past and still have to go to this church three times a week at least and try to figure out how I was supposed to fit those two things together because they seemed so brazenly different yeah, sort of square peg round hole as one might say and and figuring out how to make those two things work and they just didn't work out um it just never would and i didn't realize that till i was probably 16 or 17 where i was like okay well one of these is going to have to go and only one of them is really a choice so mm. You said earlier that there was just that expectation that everyone in the town would go to church and that's just what you did. Yes. Was your family going through the motions or were they very religious? Very religious. I mean, I know it's a bit blurry, but... Okay. No, no, no. Um, no, they were very religious. Uh, when I say very religious, you'll also have to understand that my scope of reference comes from people who I've seen that are hyper-religious. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Carrie or read the book Carrie, if you think of the mom in Carrie, mm -hmm. that's the type of people that really do exist in those towns. Um, it seems like a bit of cinema, Ooh. but those are very real people. So my family was religious, but not that religious. Uh, but it was very much like an important part of their lives. 
And it seemed to be Mm -hmm. an immutable fact for them. And so religion was something that didn't just come up on the Wednesday, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. It was something that was part of your everyday life. Yes, absolutely. At some point while I was a teenager, my family was pushing me to attend a Christian college and to go and become a preacher, which is something I thought that I wanted for myself at the time. Um, Yeah, it was very kind of a weird time for me. Uh, So... Yeah, that that happened, and I hope that helps to better understand sort of where my family was at as religion was concerned. But you also have to understand that Oklahoma religion, uh, as Christianity is concerned, is very different from... Let's not just restrict it to Oklahoma. Let's call it the Bible Belt. Midwestern Mm -hmm. American religion is a little fast and loose with itself. They, they don't stick to the talking points very well. <laughs> uh, they like to grab a few platforms that feel kind of right to them and run with those and forget about all the other little things that they should be doing. Oh, yeah, kindness and tolerance. Pfft, who cares about that, right? right? Yeah, don't, don't think about that. Um, just worry <laughs> a little bit about more, you know, who's gay and what's going on in people's pants. And so then for you at 16, 17, realizing that you couldn't reconcile these two parts of your identity, the religious side with the non-heterosexual side, what happened? So when I was 16, I came out to my best friend. Um, What's your best friend's name? Should we give a shout out? uh, Well, his name is, his name at the time was Josh. So I've had like, I know you say best friend and you want to qualify that as one person, but I have like three different people that I would call my best friend. (laughs) Um, One of those. I know. Yeah. So, um, (laughs) so Josh was my best friend that I came out to at the time. Um, And I think there was a little bit of a air about it for maybe a week or two, but then we moved past that and everything was fine. So what do you mean air about it? Like awkwardness? A little bit of awkwardness and it probably could have just been me. Um, it could very well have just been my mm-hmm. own hangups that I had about it in retrospect, but that encouraged me to come out to more people in my life and, and, you know, as far as close friends were concerned. So I had a little bit of a group that was supportive of me in my last couple of years of high school. And that made a huge difference. And it really started, I, that also is when I started pulling away from the church in a way that was meaningful to me to where I stopped participating in things actively and sort of just started going through the motions myself, knowing that at some point I wouldn't have to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Just survive. Exactly. Until you were ready to leave. Exactly. And so if they were all steeped in that town's like religion, was there anything that they struggled with in accepting you? Uh, Yes. Well, not in accepting me. I wouldn't say that. Sorry, I'm asking you to speak for them. No, 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 you're fine. I don't think so in accepting me because, again, we remain friends to this day. Um, Josh, unfortunately, has passed away. But my friend Alan and my friend Aaron, who I came out to, are both great friends. I saw Alan last night. That was one of our friends who came over. So I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think maybe they probably had their own religious trauma to deal with and and hangups to get past. Mm-hmm. But I also think they came at it with very different perspectives than I did because I was trying so hard to fit in that I thought that's something that I needed to do. Yeah. And I don't know that they had that same exact mentality. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the very last time you ever went to church? Oh, gosh, no. I I don't really remember do you remember what those feelings in the last few times you went? Resentment would be the best way to put it. I really resented the church or what it represented um, or in how it was portrayed as the supposing loving and inclusive place that really was the exact opposite. The people mm-hmm. there spent so much time segregating groups of people in their minds and in their testaments that like... It, it's baffling to me to think about them even claiming it to be a religion of love whenever there's so much time spent on who we shouldn't love. So yeah, I would say my, my last 
times there will definitely be resentment and anger. Yeah, let's go with anger. I had a lot of that for a minute. But, you know, luckily, uh, with age, that's sort of dwindled. <laughs> is that is that a lucky thing? Sometimes I think it's good to be angry. I have developed this wonderful life skill of being able to hold grudges uh, without being angry about them until I want to be. It's really nice. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Ooh, <laughs> just push that down, bring it up later. No, oh, it's like I can put it in a little box. It doesn't affect me, and I pull it out whenever I feel like it. And if I don't want to be angry about it, I'm just not. <laughs> you should be a mother. Um, so the, <laughs> but this is what I was going to ask you, actually, because you don't strike me as a person that is, and I'm making lots of assumptions, no, so absolutely fine. tell me if I'm full of shit. You don't strike me as a person who is very confrontational. So what happened to the anger? Uh, I I stuffed it down and I kept it inside. Um, It would kind of blow up in these big explosions of being upset. And then it would go back to just kind of hoping to temper it for as long as I could. Through therapy, I've learned much better ways to deal with that. Um, Which is just storing it. Well, no, now I actually go in and I, (laughs) I, I confront people depending on how it needs to be handled sometimes i do it very most of the time i'm very tactful about it this anger and the way it spilled over i guess i'm leading us up to asking about how this all affected your relationship with your parents at the time i really thought that i had a good relationship with my mom and then i didn't really have a lot of a relationship with my dad um he Mm-hmm. was one of the, still is one of those people who tries to show his affection through work meaning i can provide for you by going to work and that's that's okay. you should take that as love so you know you see him when you saw him but it definitely put a strain on my relationship with my mom because she was worried about my immortal soul for a good long while i didn't really talk to my dad about it for ever and i still don't think we really had any sort of weird discussion about it i mean he came to our wedding and he's been supportive but she would call me and i would feel obligated to answer it uh, my mom that is and Mm -hmm. so i would answer the phone call and it would be this whole conversation about you know i'm just worried about your soul i'm just worried about you know this and i Yeah, there was a point that it came to where I said, I'm not going to talk to you anymore until you can talk to me like I'm a human being because you're not talking to me like a person. You're talking to me like I am some sort of problem you have to solve. And that isn't respectful of me at all. Um, So we didn't talk for a few months because she would call and I just wouldn't answer. And then at some point I did. I think it was probably two, maybe three months later. And I was just like, I answered the phone call. And I said, if you are calling to talk to me about being gay or my soul or church or any of that, I'm going to hang up. So let me know in advance, because if you do, I'm going to hang up on you anyways. And then I'm not going to answer your phone calls for several more months, basically. But no, she talked to me like a person. And then it kind of went on this up and down little roller coaster from there. But um, she's definitely at a point now where everything's fine. So and, and, and so how old were you then? Were you like in college at this point? Uh, yeah, so I was probably 18, 19, somewhere in that area. Um, okay. No, probably 19. And, um, and, and these calls, she would just ring you and be like, not talk about anything else, just talk about your soul. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, uh, it was really hurtful. And how long would they go for? Longer than they should have, because again, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, I am a chronic people pleaser. Um, so I didn't realize that you could just mm-hmm. say, no, I don't want to have this conversation and then not talk about it until at one point I did. Oof. How did it feel after you said that to her, that you didn't want to have that conversation again? Uh, I was a little worried. I think that any person at that age would be concerned especially if they had a relationship with the parent at that point that didn't feel yeah. you know we i thought what we had was a good relationship and looking back on it in retrospect it was very much a, i was sort of her go-to to lean on emotionally mm-hmm. so it was just i don't know i it, it felt weird i felt like if i wasn't going to be there for her who was 
but then I also had to get past that because it's not my responsibility. Yeah. As the child, yeah. it's not my responsibility. And have you ever talked about that dynamic since then or have you just kind of buried it down and no, not with her but with my therapist and, and going through the process of kind of unraveling a lot of this and realizing that that dynamic was super unhealthy for me and definitely probably not healthy for her either but I, you know her mental health is not my responsibility but realizing, like, okay, that wasn't a healthy relationship for a child to have. Like, you shouldn't be the emotional center of the entire family at that age, especially as the youngest child. Like, you should never be the person that everybody's sort of leaning on. And, yeah, so I, I've had the conversation, just not with her. And there's no reason to have it with her. It would be nothing Nothing productive could come from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly not if you raise it with her I guess I'm just asking whether she's had the opportunity to reflect and to feedback about those conversations that you had when you were 18 uh no I guess not we've never really spoken about it since um in my mind I'm willing to let it go it's you know it's all so much dust to me at this point Mm. I'm just reflecting on my own experiences when I'm saying this. So it's probably not um, the same as yours. But I think it's such a shame that you can't always be honest with your parents. And sometimes you have to protect them or you have to just let things go because you know that the conversation, if you do broach it, is just going to be this minefield of emotional outbursts. Ooh, shouldn't have said that. No, that's about right. (laughs) I I Mm. guess I'm to a point now where I just don't care. I don't really go out of my way to protect them from anything. Uh, If I have a conversation Mm. about something, I'm very candid about it. Uh, I don't try to protect them from my existence or my life at this point, because if they have a problem with it, that's their problem and not mine. And I will generally say as much. Yeah, but sometimes surviving a moment is more important than having an altercation. Oh, Oh, certainly. And especially when you are at an age where you're reliant on these people to put a roof over your head and food Mm. in your mouth. And it's completely understandable why you avoid having any of these conversations with parents that you think will even marginally react poorly to this because kids have ended up on the streets for less. And it is so ridiculous to me that people like that will have children because if you have at any point in time considered having a child and you think if that child turns out to be gay or trans or anything that's not acceptable to me, I'm going to kick them out and put them on the street... You don't need to be having a child. That's not what you want. You Mm. want an ideal. You don't want a child. So go get a dog instead because that dog will never disappoint you. But even then, like, did did you see... This might be like a Daily Mail headline or something. (laughs) About this man who got a dog and the dog was gay, so he, like, got rid of the dog? I didn't realize that could be the case. Uh, I guess if you are worried about your dog being gay, don't get a dog either. That seems wild to me. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So this was in the independent. So not quite the daily mail owners abandoned dog because he was gay. Shelter says what the black and brown pooch Fesco is looking for a new home after his apparently homophobic humans dropped him off at a shelter. So sad. North Carolina. That's... Oh, North Carolina. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. But anyway, if you believe that other people shouldn't exist, then maybe you just don't interact with the world. I think that's the lesson. It really is. That's kind of the fight we're fighting currently in the U.S. in states like Florida (laughs) and just with these don't say gay laws. And we... Oh, my gosh. It's wild to me how much Christianity and evangelical Christians have taken the helm of this fight to sanitize the public for themselves because they don't want to see other people existing. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because those same people will be like, this is America, the land of the free and completely not get the cognitive dissonance that is involved with saying that. 
and simultaneously like religion washing society. I feel like maybe we should move on to this <laughs> conversation because it's going to get depressing. I can soapbox this one for a while. So yeah, probably so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So why don't we go to Stonewall? Oh, yes. And not Stonewall, Stonewall, yeah. yeah, but Stonewall. This isn't the famous one. Uh, <laughs> listener, this is not the famous one. This is a much less known one, unless you lived in Stillwater, Oklahoma at the time, in which case it's very famous there amongst the town of, you know, a few thousand people. Ah, so that was going to be my question. Like, how big is Stillwater? But it's, it's tiny. So how did they get a gay bar? Uh, so it's not really a gay bar. Oh, so it's Stonewall. Gay exists in still or used to exist in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Stillwater, Oklahoma is a college town. It is home to Oklahoma State University. So the population when school is out is around 20-ish thousand people. And while school is in, it jumps to about 50,000 people. Wow. So we had a decent sampling of people, but the Stonewall was more of a let's call it a stand-in for a gay bar. Because that's where all of the queer people went. Even though it was not officially a gay bar, that's just where you went. So how? How do you know to go there? Well, one, it's called the Stonewall. Um, (laughs) So we at least had that going (laughs) for it. I joined an organization in uh, my first semester of college called the Sexual Orientation Diversity Association, or SODA for short. And uh, so older queers than me had been going there and introduced me to it. So the Stonewall was sort of a dive. Um, I'd say sort of a dive. It was quite a dive bar. If you looked up dive bar, Stonewall (laughs) would be there. Uh, You had to like scrape the cigarette smoke off the walls. Um, And it was very much the people who just didn't fit in anywhere else sort of showed up there. And you had regulars who were bar flies that would sit. You'd see them at the bar every time you walk in. They're sitting at the bar any day of the week. They're always there. It's like they just live there. But yeah, the clientele is very much like if you don't want to go to some country bar, you don't want to go to a college bar where everyone's just going crazy, doing shots and being insane. Like this is where you went. So paint the scene for me. So I've just found out that this was a college town. So I am going to make the big leap and assume that you were there for college. I was, but also Stillwater, Oklahoma was 15 minutes away from my hometown. So I'd spent a lot of time there um, when I could drive and could get away from Glencoe. That's where I spent my time. Um, But yes, I was there for college. Uh, because Glencoe is a small town of 500 people and has nothing in it. And, uh, I could go to the movies or I could go to a restaurant or something oh, okay. else in Stillwater. Uh, so, you know, getting out of town, that was, that's what you did. We went bowling a lot. Okay. I know that sounds very boring, yeah. but it was way more exciting than what we could do in Glencoe, Oklahoma. <laughs> well, okay. So then paint the scene for me. So who was Anthony at 18? Ah, uh, Anthony at 18, who was getting out of Glencoe, Oklahoma, who was getting into queer culture and diving in head first, did the complete 180 of, of little Christian Anthony. Uh, I jumped into as much debauchery Ooh. as possible. Were there hot pants involved? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> I... I did some very questionable things uh, and some not so questionable <gasps> things Some things that, you know, you're just you're getting out of your shell finally. And I I did it with such drastic and dramatic flair. Um, OK, this is a bit too vague for me. This is a bit too vague. So what were okay. the debaucherous things? <laughs> uh, so I... At 18, I had my first uh, three-way, which was unexpected because I was uh, starting to, um, you know, things were getting hot and heavy between this guy and I at a retreat. And I didn't realize there was two other people in the room with us. And one of them just sort of joined in. And, I mean, it was all very amicable. So what, no big what kind deal, of retreat was this? It was a soda retreat for that group I was telling you about. Oh, um, I see. Okay. <laughs> so it was... Yeah. It was for our Sexual Orientation Diversity Association. Um, and that led quickly to, of course, my first 
orgy and uh yeah and th- that happened on the regular for a good bit uh yeah I, I jumped into a lot of different places that i would never see myself even a couple of years prior to that but it was i mean honestly for that age like i was just i was learning about myself for being the socially awkward person i was i was surprised to find myself completely comfortable in those situations well because you don't have to talk it's simple. That's true. You don't. It is. And <laughs> and at that age, like I had I had gotten out of basic training for the military and like advanced training, and so I was in great shape. So I wasn't self conscious at all about my body. <laughs> but yeah, I did that just sort of like I I think I ran towards anything that was the exact opposite of what my life had been growing up and in high school. Mm-hmm. I went for things like. Um, I, I, I started looking more into the occult and looking into like witchcraft and Wicca. Um, Sounds pretty gay, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very gay, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you sort of jump ship and like say, okay, everything that was the exact opposite of what I was doing there seems to be the right answer. And um, it was mm-hmm. a few, it was a few years before that settled down at all um, to any sort of semblance of normalcy for me, which I. Even at this point, I, I wouldn't even say any of that's out of the norm for me, but just not as like, you know, a regular. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Like, I think n- not restricted to sexuality. I think that most teenagers go through these periods of like, I'm going to embrace the complete opposite of what I was yesterday and just become this thing for a while. Mm-hmm. But when you spend lots of time embracing these new things, it's hard to know where the real you ends and it can get a bit confusing. Yeah. It's very difficult. And I think, yeah, you're right. I think it's just such a thing for teenagers as they, especially as you're getting into college and starting to experience the world at large for the first time, you, you jump into anything and everything that's new and exciting. And a lot of times that's the opposite of what you're used to. And, uh, For me, it worked out because I learned a lot about myself during that time uh, and especially figuring out like my sexual identity and figuring out like what I was looking for in the rest of my life. Granted, it wouldn't ever sort of like, I guess, solidify until much later, but it was still a great jumping off point for me to realize, okay, these are things that I want in my life going forward. I don't necessarily want monogamy for the sake of monogamy i like you know being poly i like you know being outside of that i like being open those are things that i want for myself and at the time i guess i sort of chalked it up to we'll see where we're at in a few years with this but you know it's been several more years than that and still sort of in the same place so here we are (laughs) yeah and like i'm not not like rubbishing the experimentation of teenagers or anyone for that matter, because I think it's worth trying things on and just seeing how they feel. This is giving me flashbacks though. I had this period where I thought that most queer people were very tactile. So then therefore I should try being tactile and it didn't really work. I think I just scared people by hugging them. Mm. (laughs) I have to be very comfortable with it. I used to be a bit of a hugger, and now I'm kind of the opposite of that. I I get very weird about hugging people I don't know. So that is something that changed. And and Yeah, me too. But also recently, I've been a bit like, I do not want to shake your hand. (laughs) (sighs) That is also something that I am discovering about myself. It, It is crazy to me to feel that way but i just there are times i don't want that physical contact it's just such an odd custom it's like what what like just say hello like i can see you there you don't like <laughs> it's it's so strange but yeah you're right i don't like giving handshakes most of the time and you know, especially in my work, I, I felt obligated. New people will come into the office and be like, oh, I'm such and such from such department. And I'm like, oh, hi, how are you? Luckily, I've got such a positioning of my desk that it kind of lends to not getting up and shaking their hand. <laughs> so I don't do it nearly as often. But yeah, yeah I, I don't like it. I don't like that uh, sort of forced contact. Yeah, I think there might be something as well in it about the power dynamics that are 
played out sometimes in a handshake? Like, you know how you're taught you have to look them in the eye when you shake oh, their hand. You yes. have to have a firm grip. And there's some people that, like, take that to this really weird extreme level where it feels like yeah. they're trying to out macho you or something. And then it just gets really awkward for me. I don't like that. And that is weird. And I think people who are like that are weird. I think they should get therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone who's out there listening, let's normalize just saying hello and not touching. Exactly. Just try it. Exactly. I don't need to touch your hand that I don't know where it's been. And you don't need to touch my hand that you don't know where it's been. (laughs) Having said that, I will suck a stranger's cock. So, I mean, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. Exactly. And I was going to say that. And I'm glad that you uh, pulled the Band-Aid off of that one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's different though because it's serving more of a purpose than a handshake exactly exactly we're really getting to know each other for the few minutes we'll be together <laughs> and so you were trying on these different bits of your personality we're embracing different things in that period does that mean you were comfortable in your queerness I was getting comfortable in my queerness. I was getting surprisingly comfortable in my queerness to the point that I was, you know, going to and participating in pride parades, uh, being part of floats and things like that. Finally going to actual factual gay bars. Uh, we didn't have any in Stillwater, but there are a couple in Oklahoma city and those are still there today, Mm -hmm. but just really diving in sort of head first and experiencing what I had never thought was something that I would experience before in my life. And it was, it was great. I, I got so comfortable in that portion of my life and I loved it, but I didn't realize I was still sort of segmenting it off from my professional life and from how I presented myself in other aspects of my life. And it didn't sort of, I guess, come to a head for me until like years later when I realized that I was still giving off these very vague answers when people would ask me what I did on my days off. Oh, I went, you know, um, to the lake with, you know, my partner's, you know, parents or something like that. Or I'd make it real vague or I'd even say like girlfriend or something. And, and in looking back on that, I think that is so unfair to that person. We should never have like been together for that length of time in the first place. That was a really toxic relationship. Which person? The partner or the past you? The partner and the past me. Both of those people okay. it wasn't fair to. But I still had like this whole segmented portion. And that actually was where the stone wall sort of came in. You know, that was the place where we would gather. That was the place where we'd get together with our queer friends and hang out. So it was a place where I could be myself more than I could be anywhere else. And that, yeah, I guess I did sort of dive headfirst into this identity, but I still had it segmented off from different portions of my life because I thought that was necessary. Why did you think it was necessary? Uh, I worried about what people would think of me for being queer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really it. I worried about what other people thought because, again, chronic people pleaser. I don't want people to feel uncomfortable. And how did you balance that? dissonance of being a proud that's my word you didn't ever say that you were proud but being a proud queer man and then also not talking about it I'd say given the actions I was proud um I don't really know I I think I kept trying to wait for the right moment and when is that moment ever going to exist you know like the moment doesn't just happen you have to make it happen that isn't to say to any mm. you know queer listeners out there who aren't out at certain places of their lives that you should just go do that. But don't wait for a moment. If you feel like it's necessary, then you have to create that moment because it's just never going to happen otherwise. Mm. And you talk about yourself as a people pleaser as though that was a past trait of yours. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm not a people pleaser anymore. How do you move beyond it? Lots and lots of therapy. Um, (laughs) So for us broke people who can't afford therapy, what would you say? (laughs) Um, It starts with realizing that self-confidence and being proud of yourself and caring about yourself are not selfish things. 
you have to be able to understand what your boundaries are and draw those boundaries firmly. And it's okay. And if it's not okay with somebody that you draw a boundary with, that person doesn't respect you. And it's okay to let that go, to let them go um, and let that aspect of a relationship go. Because if they can't respect your boundaries, then they don't respect you. And that's not good for you. And it's not okay for that to be the case. And you're not selfish for thinking that. But what if you are, like, so just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, no, you're fine. Shoot me down. What if you are just being selfish one day? That's okay. What's wrong with being selfish? <laughs> I don't know. I don't I think know. that being selfish inherently is a bad thing. Um, if you're doing something for yourself, it's not selfishness. I think we've really, as a society, we've equated selfishness with being bad. But that's not the case. Doing things for yourself is necessary. It's not just useful, but it is absolutely necessary if you want to continue to thrive in your existence. And everybody wants to thrive. It's all we're looking for is happiness. And a lot of times happiness is just something that you achieve by stopping doing certain things in your life instead of doing new things and finding this magical point that's far and away from you. It's really more of a cessation of actions that don't really serve you anymore, you know, letting people cross those boundaries or not putting them up in the first place. Those are easy ways to make yourself very unhappy. So go do the selfish thing. Take time off for yourself. Mm. Go do something by yourself. If you tell someone that you're not doing anything today and they ask you to do something and you really don't want to do anything today, tell them that you're not doing anything today and that's your plan. And if they care about you, they'll be okay with that. Oh yeah. I, I don't think that was the type of thing I was thinking about. I think that there's some people who take these types of concepts and truths and then they just kind of warp them into this really like weird self-entitled excuse for themselves to I th just be a dickhead. Oh yes. Okay. Now I understand. So when you say being selfish, you, you also might be referring to being an asshole and being selfish. Yes. Yeah. 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 Is that correct? Yeah. Like just okay. taking advantage of people and then being like, Oh, I, I've got my boundaries now. So I don't want to see you even though you just helped me move. I see what you're saying. That person <laughs> is an asshole. And so that's not self-care. That's just being yeah, an asshole. Yeah. Using people isn't self-care. That's very different. Um, but I can see exactly what you're saying. And I don't think that um, being selfish for the sake of self-care is a different thing than being selfish for the sake of being kind of a dick bag. You know, self-care mm. and getting what you mm. want because you need something or want something uh, is not the same thing. But people have such different lines that they draw. Yeah. And assholes will always exist. I hate saying that because I wish they wouldn't. But if for some reason somebody does that to you and they say they're doing it for self-care, it's okay for you in your own interest of self-care to cut that person out of your life and never do anything for them again if you don't want until you feel comfortable doing so. Oh, yeah. I think it's like there's something for me about wanting to feel uh, superior in the moment. So, you know, what happens a lot is that people kind of drop out of your life, right? Like they just kind of stop talking to you because yes. like either there's too much going on in their life and they kind of feel a bit fraught and pulled in lots of different directions or there's something between the two of you that's just a bit icky for the time being and they just need a little bit of distance. And then like they don't talk to you for a year or whatever and then they want to like pick up and pretend that nothing's happened. Whenever this has happened to me, I'm like, oh, do you know what? You, like, you didn't talk to me for a year. I kind of don't want to be your friend anymore. Like, I kind of, I'm done. Like, I've, I've mourned this friendship and I'm going to move on. And then they can respond in this way like, oh, but I was having a mental health problem at that time or I was this at that time and blah, 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 blah. And that really pisses me off. <laughs> I don't know why I'm bringing this to the table, but like that kind of thing really pisses me off because it's like, well, I'm not responsible for you having not spoken to me for a year and I had to make a decision 
or I had to like reconcile that whole thing. And like now I couldn't give a fuck about you. So I'm not going to be made to feel bad because you were having some mental health problem. I sound like I'm talking about a person in particular and I'm not. <laughs> and to that, I really say it's okay if that person really was having, you know, a mental health crisis, but they also can't expect people to sit around and wait for them. It's They also need to accept that if somebody doesn't want them back in their lives after that amount of time, it's, I mean, it's completely within that other person's rights to do so. Yeah, but it just, yeah, it just makes me feel like I'm the bad guy if I'm the one setting that boundary. But anyway, that's a that's an issue no, I need to do. You're not the bad guy. With. No, you're not you're not the bad guy in that situation. You're just doing what's best for you. No, and there is no bad guy. No, there's not. Yeah. 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 Um. So, so do you remember the first time you ever went to Stonewall? I believe the first time we went, we went to the beer garden. Uh, it was after a soda meeting, and. Everyone had invited me to go, and I wasn't sure about it because I'd never been to a bar before. Oh. Well, and uh, yeah, so it was, you know, baby 18-year-old me. I'd never had that experience, but there was a guy who was in soda who was going, and I thought he was cute, and so I also went. Um, yeah, yeah. So then we went and we sat in the beer garden, and uh, yeah, it was it was rather exciting. And did you get your flirt on? <sighs> My awkward 18-year-old flirt? Yes. I don't know how well it was working. (laughs) Uh, It must have worked to some degree because eventually we ended up uh, dating and we were together for almost five years. What? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Oh, God. So it wasn't like a, I'm going to sow my wild seeds and like see Not what that this night. is all about. It was yeah. like, let me settle down for five years. I know. I know. A stupid young me thought monogamy was like it for, I mean, I, I understood that I was poly and open and we still like, you know, did things outside of our relationship, but it was just more of like a, I don't know. I think my expectations of relationships were a little skewed from seeing my parents and watching that sort of weird heteronormative thing where like, and especially in small town Oklahoma where, you know, you're expected to like settle down fresh out of high school. And like, I I just saw so many of my friends Mm. stay in their relationships from high school and go on and just like some of them are still together to this day. Stop making babies. It's wild. Yeah. And I just, do not get it. Now that I'm an adult, I'm like, wow, I didn't really figure out what I was looking for in a relationship until I was like 28. <laughs> but but even just like having someone tolerate you for five years is a huge accomplishment. I'm kind of surprised that we taught, it was a really toxic relationship looking back on it. And we really, oh, we shouldn't have been together that long. We were not healthy for one another. So, and, and I wish him all the best. It's just one of those things where in retro, like yeah, yeah. As I think back on the way we treated each other, I'm like, that wasn't very good for either of us. Okay, well, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about <laughs> and why it's... why it was the place that you wanted to talk about today. Like, why is it special to you? So it really was the place that you would go to feel more accepted as a queer person. Uh, so as I started getting older and past that early point uh, in my little queer life, the Stonewall sort of evolved itself, but it also became this place like that was the accepted place where gay people went. You would go, you'd enjoy yourself. On Thursday, they did what they call techno beatdown. Uh, and so they'd play a lot of, it was a lot of EDM. A lot of gay people showed up. And yeah, it was a very gay night of the week. It seems like the craziest thing, but like all the gay people would be there. You could dance with other guys and not have anybody look at you sideways. It was a sort of sanctuary in this very conservative place uh, for you to go to, even though it wasn't technically a gay bar. That's where the gay people went. And so, yeah, it became the place that, you know, I I went with my friends. You could go. You could be more open. You could be gay in public at that place. And um, it wasn't something that I realized that I needed in my life. You may never think that you need that openness and that ability to maybe Mm -hmm. hold hands with a partner or be able to dance with another person without anybody looking at you weird. But that amount of freedom being afforded to you in any capacity is just super liberating. Uh, and so that felt like another place that I was at home. It was a little 
piece of me that is there where I got to be myself and stop wearing masks and just, you know, take a night and, and let myself be free. And so what did having that space and having that permission teach you about yourself? It really taught me that I want more for myself than I thought I did. I thought I would be okay without, you know, doing any sort of public displays of affection. I thought I would be okay sort of wearing certain masks in my life mm. forever. I kind of ad infinitum and um, it's not, it's not for me. I, I have this genuine want to be the person who I am on the inside, on the outside as well. And I need that to be happy. And that's really what I learned there at, at a bar of all places. It's bars are so ingrained in gay culture. Um, but you know, that's really where we find ourselves most of the time. Right. It was an intersection of my queer friends and my straight friends. And just, we could all show up there. Everybody could be who they were and it didn't matter. And that was something so alien to me, but so liberating. And it was just wonderful. Do you have any memories of the Stonewall Tavern or maybe clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, I would love to hear all about it, so why not get in touch? I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing, but I need your help. Go to lostspacespodcast.com, find the section, share a lost space, and then tell me all about what it is you got up to. You can also reach out to me on Facebook and Instagram, where my handle is Lost Spaces Pod. Find out more about Anthony by giving his podcast, Beards and Sundries, a little listen wherever you stream podcasts. Might just be the place where you're listening to this episode right this very moment. And also make sure to follow their Instagram account, which is at Beards and Sundries. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you took the time to subscribe, leave a review on your podcast platform, or just tell other people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen too. My name is Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. <laughs>